Since the dawn of time, human beings have known that they need to eat food to be able to survive, because it's by eating food that we gain our strength. In other words, food is our source of energy. Just like a car needs gas, we need to eat food to fuel our body. But energy is not enough. In the first years of the 19th century, French scientist François Magendie observed that when he fed a group of dogs only sugar or only oil, they would all die within a month. Sugar and oil both provided energy, but they did not provide the stuff that we need to build and maintain the structures in our body, proteins. Proteins are our only source of nitrogen, and without them, life is not possible. At the beginning of the 20th century, most scientists believed that eating was just a matter of getting two things, enough proteins to build and maintain our body, and enough energy to fuel it from carbohydrates and fats. But there was already a lot of evidence suggesting that nutrition is much more complicated than that. It had been known for decades that food can convey some particular factors whose deficiency can cause disease and death. Since ancient times, for example, many suspected that diet had something to do with scurvy, a disease that causes progressive deterioration of body, eventually resulting in death. Scurvy especially plagued sailors who embarked on months-long journeys with limited access to fresh food. And whenever, for one reason or the other, maybe a famine, a war, or a siege, a population had limited access to fresh food, the incidence of scurvy would skyrocket. In the second half of the 18th century, Scottish physician James Lind was conducting the first clinical trial ever recorded in the history of science, and it's not without a little pride that nutritionists like to tell this story, because the first clinical trial ever was a dietary intervention. Dr. Lin thought that scurvy could be treated by eating acidic foods, and so he recruited 12 sailors affected by scurvy and divided them in six groups of two. They were all eating the same diet, but on top of that, each group received a different acidic food. Most of those acidic food, like vinegar, did not do anything at all. Only two groups were substantially improving. The group eating two oranges and one lemon every day, and the group drinking a quart of fruit cider every day. In 1753, Dr. Lind reported his findings in a book, A Treatise on the Scurvy, which unfortunately went virtually unnoticed. A few years later, British explorer James Cook and his crew set sails for a very long journey over three years. But interestingly enough, during this whole time, he didn't have one single case of scurvy. Of course, he couldn't bring oranges or lemons with him, because they were all perishable. What saved him and his crew was consumption of a rather unusual food, sauerkraut, fermented cabbage, that contrary to fresh fruit and vegetables can be easily preserved in big wooden barrels where its fermentation takes place. It was clear at that point that there had to be something in oranges, lemons, cider, and sauerkraut that is able to prevent and cure scurvy. But it was not acidity by itself, like Dr. Lin believed. It is one specific molecule that our body needs to synthesize collagen, and that was finally identified in 1937 by Albert Sens Georgi, who won a Nobel Prize for it. This molecule is ascorbic acid, better known as vitamin C. About a century after Captain Cook's expeditions, a Dutch scientist named Christian Eichmann was sent by his government on a mission to Indonesia to study beriberi, a serious neurologic disease that was killing tens of thousands of people in that region. His task was trying to identify the germ that was causing it. Dr. Eichmann came across very interesting observations. He noticed that beriberi was especially common among those populations whose staple was white rice, and even more so among prison inmates whose tough diet was basically rice and little else. In some Indonesian prisons, to make their lives even more miserable, inmates were not even given good rice, but rice mixed with husks, the byproduct that's left after rice milling and polishing to make white rice from brown rice, and that was normally given to the pigs. But lo and behold, among these prisoners subjected to this very humiliating treatment, the incidence of beriberi was dramatically lower. 
Indeed, he observed time and again that when polished white rice in a patient's diet was replaced with whole grain brown rice, the disease would disappear. With this information, Aikman set up a very elegant experiment. He took a group of chickens and fed half of them white polished rice and the other half brown unpolished rice. The chicken fed refined rice all developed very berry and died very soon, while well, none of the chickens fed whole rice contracted the disease. At that point, he got a group of diseased chickens and fed them just the discarded outer husks that are left after polishing rice. The chickens all quickly recovered. At this point, Dr. Aikman had all the pieces of information he needed to put the puzzle together, but he was so stubbornly misled by what he had already decided that he just couldn't see it. There must be something in the outer husk of rice, he wrote, that confers resistance to the beriberi germ. We know today that there is no beriberi germ. Beriberi is just another disease of nutrition deficiency. Specifically, it is caused by the lack of a nutrient that was finally identified in 1926. This essential nutrient is thiamine, or vitamin B1, that is present in the external layers of rice, but is removed when brown rice is polished to make white rice. A few decades after Dr. Aikman's research, Dr. Joseph Goldberger was dealing with another disease that was plaguing several hundred thousand people in the south of the United States and killing about one in ten. It was called pellagra, from the Latin rough skin, characterized indeed by severe skin rashes and mental impairment. Most scientists again believed it was caused by a germ, but Dr. Goldberger was not convinced. If it was an infectious disease, he wondered, then why would it be so common among prison inmates, but not their well-fed guards? This was a disease hitting above all poor people, people whose diet was mainly made up of corn. Dr. Goldberger hypothesized that pellagra was a deficiency disease, caused by a poor diet and not by a germ. Among general skepticism, he went on to conduct experiments on prison inmates affected by pellagra and made them follow a more varied diet, including meat. In just a few weeks, they fully recovered. To further prove his theory, he then recruited 11 healthy prison inmates, and they accepted to go on an unbalanced, corn-based diet. In a few months, more than half of them developed pellagra. It was obvious to Dr. Goldberger that there had to be some essential nutrient which was absent in corn and whose deficiency caused pellagra. But this was not as obvious to most of his colleagues, who still believed there had to be a germ causing pellagra, and that a poor diet was just a predisposing factor. So to prove his point, Dr. Goldberger collected pellagra patients' skin fragments, nasal secretions, and other bodily fluids, and injected himself with them. Since indeed there was no pellagra germ, he remained perfectly healthy. What was causing the disease was again the lack of an essential nutrient, which was later identified as niacin, or vitamin B3, also referred to as pellagra preventive vitamin, PP. There was only one thing that Dr. Goldberger couldn't figure out. He knew that the diet of many rural Mexican population was also based on corn, which they used to make tortillas, and yet they did not develop pellagra. How was that possible? The trick is there actually is niacin in corn, but it is bound to proteins in a form that is not available for absorption into our body. However, when corn is soaked and cooked in alkaline solution, as the Mexican did by cooking corn in lime water to make tortillas, free niacin is released from the proteins and it becomes bioavailable. This is why the Mexicans were not developing the disease. You're probably wondering if the corn you eat undergoes such treatment, and the answer is yes. The canned yellow corn kernels that you find on the shelves of your grocery store have been pre-cooked in alkaline water to make niacin bioavailable. We could go on and on telling little stories like these for rickets and vitamin D, iodine and goiter, iron and anemia, and so on for about 40 essential elements. We will tell some of these stories later in this course when we study the vitamins and minerals, but for now, I think I have made the point to help us understand the first goal of nutrition. We need to eat to prevent deficiencies. Not only deficiencies of energy and proteins, but also deficiencies of many other essential nutrients that we need in much smaller amounts, but that are absolutely necessary to sustain life. 
and without which we face disease and death. The major risks related to an unbalanced diet today are much different than what they were in the past. In our rich post-industrialized countries, we don't die of protein energy malnutrition, scurvy, beriberi, or pellagra anymore. But this is not to say that we shouldn't worry about nutrient deficiencies, even without getting to the point of overt clinical deficiencies that result in disease. Suboptimal intake of many nutrients are still extremely common, even in our rich countries, and they result in suboptimal health.